let's open the Word of God together. And I want to talk about surges and spikes. You know what that means? That's the new words in our vocabulary, right? The pandemic is going on. There's coronavirus surges in Texas, Arizona, in the state of Florida. Fortunately, with the spikes and the surges, there hasn't been a proportional increase in deaths. But these are the words we hear now. There's a surge over there. There's, it's spiking, and there's charts and all that. And we've got to be careful and wear our face masks and do whatever the authorities tell us to do on that front so we can be as safe as possible. But there's another kind of spiking and surging. There's actually two. So that you can pray better. I just heard from a dear friend who's in a leader pos leadership position over an entire state of a certain denomination that this past week, two ministers got so discouraged they just flat out quit. Didn't go through proper protocol, didn't go to the church, submit a, submit a letter of resignation, let's meet with the board. The discouragement is so heavy right now. Financial, family problems. When are we going to get out of this? I can't do virtual services as easy as other churches. My congregation is smaller. These two guys, good men from what I understand, they just up and quit. Adios, I'm gone. And that's sad. So pray for all pastors now. It's not easy right now throughout the country. There's a spike, there's a surge in discouragement. Uh, and not just ministers, but rank and file believers too. I'm focusing in here <clears throat> on this teaching on Christians. But the other spike I want to talk about is I hear that too, because I'm on the phone constantly now with ministers from around the country calling me, I call them, uh, I've taped some messages for conferences, and so on and so forth, and I say, how are things going in your church, and this and that, and there is a surge and a spike, not only in coronavirus, but in something called the SARKs. S-A-R-X, the flesh, among Christians. Well, how could you be a, be a Christian and be getting into bad behavior patterns? Let's talk about that in a biblical kind of analysis way. Let's do a Bible study, but we're going to apply it to what's going on. Because right now I'm hearing Christians yelling at each other, mad at each other, political arguments, losing their temper, being rough with their, their spouse or, or their children. And they're Christians. They're followers of Jesus who said, love one another even as I have loved you. I mean, so what's going on? If you're naive and you're new or you in the Lord, or you come from a legalistic church, the old answer was, I thought that, thought that man was a Christian. Obviously, by doing that and saying that, he's not a Christian. Because if you're born again, you're a new creation. Old things have passed away. That's just a shame that guy was a counterfeit. And for that little lady with him too. What are they doing? And maybe you've wondered about that yourself. Satan comes and accuses us like, how could you act like that? How could you react like that? How could you say that? How could you get involved in that? And then, then lift your hands and, and sing, all hail the power of Jesus' name. I mean, what's going on? So let's analyze this. I'm not talking now about demonic attacks. That's another subject for another time. I'm talking about something a lot closer to home. So our Bible study begins in Galatians 5. Verse 1 says, it was, I'm reading from the New American Standard uh, today. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. All right. Christ has set us free. We're not slaves anymore. What's that all about? He's not talking about the question of slavery in New Testament times. He's talking about the slavery uh, of the, being under the law and trying to earn your salvation. 
always trying to get a little bit better so that God would say, okay, now you're, now you're good. Now you're good to go. Now you can come to heaven. You've been living good enough life. And that is a yoke of slavery because you never know if you've done enough. The enemy has a field day when you're trying to merit your salvation instead of seeing it as a free gift from Jesus Christ. So the background of the book of Galatians is that teachers had come in, fake teachers, false teachers, come in after Paul was there and brought false doctrine into the church and tried to get the people to go back to the Jewish law as a means of salvation. Paul had said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Repent of your sins. Confess what you've done wrong and repent. 180, turn to the Lord and trust him and you shall be saved. Not because you've earned it, but because you've received the gift. But there's something about us, as Martin Luther said, we're all legalists by nature. So when these teachers came, yeah, it sounds right. I got to be circumcised. No, but you're a Gentile. Paul never said that. No, I got to be circumcised like a Jew or I won't be a Christian. That's what the teacher said. So that's the combat doctrinally that's going on in the book of Galatians. So Paul says, hey, you're free. You're free. Then... Verses later, verse 13, same chapter, Paul says this. For you were called to freedom, brethren, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. So what's happening here? You're free. You can't earn your salvation. You've received it. But now, don't use that freedom that you are saved through the grace of God. Don't use that as an excuse to indulge the flesh. In other translations, the old nature. In other translations, the sinful nature. The Greek word is sarx, S-A-R-X. Everybody say it to count of three, sarx. One, two, three. Ah, some of you didn't do it but that's okay. Sarx, that's an important word in the New Testament. Sometimes it's used of just the physical body, our physical body. But in this context, it's used of the sinful nature, the old gym symbola. Let's just focus on me. The gym symbola who, apart from Christ, will never change. You got it? That's me. That's the original, sinful, depraved me. And you have you, but let's not put the light on that yet. Let's just talk about me. That is the sarx that Paul is saying. Don't give an opportunity for that flesh, that sarx, that old nature, to reassert himself. He used to be in charge, but when I found Christ, his domination, his power was broken in my life. But he doesn't vanish He's always lurking there, that self-principle, self-indulgence, self, just self. I want what I want when I want it. Self-centered, and that's the way we all live. Now Paul says, now you have Christ living inside of you. The Spirit is now living inside of you. But just because you're free, don't think that that sarks, that fallen nature doesn't want to reassert itself. Oh, yes, it does. Come on. Come on, be real. Do real talk with me. What Christian doesn't know that? I hear some ministers, some who I respect, uh, but I can't agree with them. They've come up with a new teaching that for hundreds of years when I'm saying Christians have believed, no, no, we have no fallen nature. We're so transformed that we don't have to deal with the old Jim Cimbala. Yeah, easy for you to say. And I don't know how honest you're being, but we all have as we're going to see these tendencies, that if we're not careful, we can say, I'm saved, I'm a Christian, so what does it matter how I live? And the, oh, the flesh just waits for that. Woof! I'll move right in and get back on the throne where I used to be. Now, is it serious? I'd say so, because in that same chapter, now Paul says, verse 19, now the deeds of the flesh, the sarks, they have deeds. They do things. 
It does things. They are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality. The sexual drive out of control, the craving fulfilled at whatever cost. Idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these of which I forewarn you just as I have forewarned you that those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of heaven. So come on, come on. Let, let's read the word and let it... Uh, He's writing to Christians. Let's understand this. He's writing to Christians. He's not talking some, to some pagans in a, in a temple somewhere over in uh, another country. He's talking to believers in the churches that he started. And he said, now you can't let that sark start dominating again. And he says, here's how you know when it's operating. This is what it does. And verse 20, does that not describe... Not just the world. The world lives in the flesh. The world, the flesh, and the devil. That dominates the population. But I'm talking about Christians now. Does this not cause us to, to pause? Idolatry, by the way, a sorcery. See, not a demon. There's something actually in the fallen nature that gravitates toward that. Beside demonic powers. Enmities. Hating people. Fussing with people. Strife. <laughs> Tug of war, jealousy, outbursts of anger. Just go on social media. You want to see the sarks in print? Just go on social media. Everybody's angry. And a lot are claiming to be Christians, but they're angry in a nasty way, all in the name of the Lord. What absolute nonsense. Disputes, dissensions, factions, groups. Political groups, liberal, conservative. Now Christians don't talk to each other because they have different political leanings. Imagine that. Jesus prayed, Father, that they might be one, even as we are one. No, now we're not even talking. My wife and I know a family in another state in the country uh, that used to live in New York. Now, because of political differences, same family, same race, they don't even talk to each other. They can't eat a meal together. But then go to church and, oh, how great is our God. Sing with me, how great. That's the sarks. That's the flesh. That's the old nature. And we can justify it because pride is associated with Jim Cimbala. I'm going to justify my sarks, my, my, my old man, that old nature, sinful nature, the flesh. I'm going to justify it. If you point it out to me, yeah, well, how about you? What, are you perfect? You don't know what I've been through. You don't know my story. Unless you walked in my shoes, don't tell me that it's wrong to throw this pot at you. That's how crazy we get. Always justifying the flesh. Instead of taking a humble position and saying, oh, there goes Jim Symbol again. What a depraved individual he is. Oh, Pastor Simba, don't say that. You are somebody. I am somebody. I just read to you who I am in the natural. That's it. Nick and, and Estelle Simba gave birth to this mess. That's why Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. What do you think this is all about? You think that we're nice people who need a little help around the edges? No, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. It's a desperate case. That's why God gave up his son. You think if we, we were basically good people, he would have to give up his son? Come on. It's a terminal case. It needs a miracle. And Jesus provided it. But now, verse 16, and here's where I want to sit for a second with you. But I say, walk in the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of of the flesh. Listen, but I say, walk by the Spirit, capital S, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. Walk by the Spirit, and that's the only way you'll defeat the longings, the desires of the flesh. 
because they're still there. And Satan, who is the god of this world, who controls media and advertising and everything else, he understands so well what I'm talking about, that there's enticements and provoking things that stir up the flesh. He sends people just after you did a Bible study. He has little emissaries. He has missionaries. You know, there's Christian missionaries. Then there's Satan's missionaries. And they just come and get up in your grill and start to just, just get you so angry. And here you were just praying and feeling the peace of God. And that flesh can so easily, who is he to talk to me like that? I remember that time in, in prep school when I was trying to witness to my roommate. I slept on the top bunk, he, and he was on the bottom. And, and he listened, but he wasn't listening that well. And I, was, I wasn't a strong witness for Christ, to be very honest with you, but I was trying my best. And I had this Bible, King James, that my mother had given me maybe when I graduated high school. So I'm now in prep school, getting ready to go to the Naval Academy. So in the middle of the night, we're talking, and we get into an argument. And instead of witnessing in love and patience, I got upset with him. I started yelling from on top. I leaned over the bed and said, what's wrong with you? What are you, stupid? Don't you see that God loves you? What are you, an idiot? That's such a great way to witness. You win a lot of people that way. And, and I'm just looking down. And he got so mad, we exchanged words. He got up, and he picked up the Bible on the desk. We shared desks facing each other. He picked up the desk, the Bible, that my mother gave me. No, you didn't go there. Yes, he picked up the Bible my mother gave me and threw it across the room. And all the little things inside of it, verses and whatnot, went flying I just started praising God on the top bunk and saying, oh, God, thank you for putting me in this situation where I can show the love of Christ. No, I didn't. I jumped off that bed, and I beat the living daylights out of him. We struggled and fought. I got on top, and I had all this adrenaline and feeling of righteous indignation, and I'm just pounding him. And he's, you know, the great way to witness. I beat him up in the name of the Lord, at least. At least you could say that. Flesh. Anger. Factions, arguing, and you don't have to get physical. It's all sinful. And the next day, his face was all a mess, and we had to make up a story about how he got like that. I never witnessed to him again. I wonder why. I never even brought up Jesus again. Oh, yeah, Jesus. Well, that's like the night you beat me up. Yeah. That's how the flesh is. Uncontrollable. The only way it can be, listen, the only way you overcome it is if you walk in the Spirit, Paul says. What does that mean? Walk by the Spirit, walk there, means be conducting yourself in the Spirit. Be conducting yourself, see, walk means to us this. But walk back there means conduct yourself, let your behavior be governed by the control of the Holy Spirit who lives inside of you. Let his power control your thoughts, your words, and your deeds. Because if he doesn't, you're going to slip back into someone else controlling them, and you know who that is. That's the old Jim. He will come out as sure as night follows day. So he's saying, now the only way to overcome it is to walk, continue in the Spirit. You can read extra verses. You can, that has its place. You can pray. You can fast for 40 days. But it comes down to daily yielding and surrendering my heart, eyes, mouth. Oh, God, help us, God, that we surrender daily because as the Spirit leads me, I can't be led by the sarks. Do you get it? You can't be led by two different forces. Two different people, either old Jim Simbola or the Holy Spirit. How about you? I vote for the Holy Spirit. So walk in the Spirit, governed by the Spirit, in the sphere of the Holy Spirit, the Greek indicates, and you won't fulfill the desires of the flesh. So this is God's plan for us. 
I want your every thought, word, and deed to be governed by me through the Holy Spirit who indwells you. Especially as you meditate on the word and fill yourself with that. Notice, and you won't for carry out the desires of the flesh. The desires there is the word lust in the King James. And the King James putting the word lust there has changed the whole meaning of that word. You have to, it's not a good translation. Why? Because the word there in the Greek doesn't mean like a negative connotation. Like, oh, he's full of lust. It's just the word for desire. And it could be a good desire. You know, I want to work out today. Or it can be a bad desire. I want to steal something. But this word in the Greek here in this sentence has a preposition to it which makes it strongly emphatic so that it's like, and you won't call, uh, carry out the cravings of the flesh. The cravings of the flesh. The flesh doesn't just like, wouldn't it be nice? It's like, it works in us so that I got to say that. Come on, haven't you ever been in a conversation and it goes into gossip or something that's not nice? And you know you've just been with the Lord in devotional time and you, you just something, the Spirit just whispers to you and goes, hush, don't enter into that. And then there's another voice saying, open su boca, add in, throw in, get into that. It's like, it's like an urge. And yet we know it's not right. It's, I wouldn't want anyone to talk about me behind my back like, like these people are talking. Nah, see, that's the flesh. The flesh doesn't care about law. It doesn't care about anything. Don't talk right and wrong to it. It's hopeless. The only way you overcome it is being by, led by the Spirit. When I'm heading this way by the Spirit, I can't be at the same time following the old Jim Symbola. So let's finish our Bible study. God's promise is, yield to my spirit and you will absolutely no go, never go back to fulfilling those cravings. It's in the double negative. So again, for emphasis, walk by the spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. You will not. No way. No way, Jose. No way. Emphatic. I give you victory over that through my spirit. I give you the victory. Now, take the victory. Some people think that we're on automatic pilot. You can just live through every day, never think about God, never spend time, never surrender, never yield, never spend time in his word, and just everything will work out. You'll find that's not true. That's why Christians have really done some ornery things and are doing ornery things, doing bad things, saying bad things. Falling into bad situations. Do we not know that? Do we not know that? Look, listen to me, everybody. Do you not know that what I'm saying is true from the word of God? You have not experienced that? There's been theologies purported in past centuries that you can get to a place of perfection where you lose any enticement to sin, any, any drawing to sin, there's just nothing there. You've been cauterized. The flesh has been burnt out. A lot of people taught that at the end of the 1800s. There was a place in holiness teaching where if you had an experience with God, he actually burnt out the old man. And now you just had you and Jesus, just Jesus, and everything was just peachy cream. Not true to life. Not true to life. Not true to Scripture, more importantly. So now let's close. Here's how the victory is won. Now listen, this is so important. For the flesh, verse 17, for the flesh sets its desires against the spirit, capital S, and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another. Listen, for the flesh, Jim Simbola, sets its desires against the spirit or lust, same word as used before. Note, the flesh sets its desires, 
It's lust. That's why the King James has, for the flesh lusted against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. The flesh lusts against the spirit and the word against there means to put down. So the flesh in me wants to put down what the Holy Spirit wants to do in my life. That's the inner war. The, the Greek picture is two armies like in World War I in trenches. And I mean settle down for the long haul. The flesh ain't given up and the spirit says no way. Because just like the flesh wants to hold down the desires and the purposes of the flesh, what, pray, serve somebody? Get up in the middle of the night and pray, read, read the word? No, no, I fight that. I'll pull you over here, I'll pull you over there. And the spirit fights against the flesh. You might just say, why doesn't the spirit just speak a word and the flesh will disappear? It's not the way it is. The way it is, is the spirit fights against, desires against to put down the flesh. So what does, what's the spirit's uh, uh, a purpose in my life? Is to keep me from sin, keep you and I from sin by overcoming the activity of the flesh in our lives. So we can be holy and like Christ. That's why the Spirit was put in us. Notice his name, Holy Spirit, as in be holy even as I am holy. That's why he's inside of us. So we don't get into fighting, rancor, arguing, immorality, sorcery, uncleanness, factions, party spirit. That's the flesh, what the flesh does. Here's what the Spirit does as I close. But the fruit of the Spirit, notice, the deeds of the flesh versus the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. When the Spirit is controlling me, he produces his fruit. It's not Jim Simbola. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to me. Stop waking up and trying to be something. Let the Spirit produce his fruit. That's how we change. Not by me. Oh, today I'm going to just be so much better. I'm going to be patient today. Have you ever tried to be patient in your own strength? Oh, worse, humble. But the fruit of the Spirit, notice, when the Spirit is leading me and controlling my mind, my mouth, and my deeds, he produces his fruit. I don't have to strain. Remember what Jesus said, abide in me and I'll abide in you. If you abide in me, you'll bear much fruit. What does the branch do? It just hangs on to the vine. And it produces the sap, produces the fruit. That's what God wants for us today. Love, joy, peace, meekness, kindness. This pandemic and political racial unrest in the country is producing an outbreak of flesh among believers. What the world does, they don't know Christ. That's not our business. Paul said, what is it my business to judge those outside the church? But brothers and sisters, can we not encourage each other and say, how would Christ say that? How would Christ post that? How would he get involved in that? Uncleanness. Unclean mouths, anger, fighting, fussing, because there's stress right now. And when stress comes, because it's stressful, the pandemic and everything, Satan uses that to stir up the flesh so we forget who we are in Christ and we go back to the old Jim Cimbala like I was when I came down so proudly. Oh, I was so proud that I beat him up. Oh, just as proud as the people who are posting their anger and, and their diatribes against other people. All in the name of the Lord. I was, when I was pounding them, oh, in the name of the Lord. Boom, bow. Until I came to a place of shame and repentance. My God, what am I doing? But in the moment, the flesh will justify everything. So I want to talk to all of you. Do you want to be like Jesus? That's what it comes down to. Or do you want to indulge the flesh? 
lot of people don't like this teaching because they don't like what God is really saying that he's called us to be. They want to go to church on Sunday and end up in heaven. But until then, hey, I got to be me. No, don't be me. Be him. Be like Jesus. Come on, we love him, don't we? And he's made a way for us to live in victory. You don't have to live in defeat. We are Christians and we're going to act like it. We're going to be what we are by the grace of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Would you pray with me? Lord, I pray for myself first that you would save me from the flesh. That I daily, Lord, would live under the control of your spirit. Make us sensitive, God, that if we grieve the spirit or we put out his fire in any way, that you'll alert us that we need to make an adjustment. We need to get away and get our hearts in tune and surrendered afresh. And if it takes a thousand surrenders a month, let it be so, Lord. We got to keep coming to you, Lord, to yield. You are a master. You shape our thoughts. I don't want my thoughts. I want your thoughts. I don't want my words. I want your words. I don't want what I think is right. God, please put in my heart Christ-like desires through the Spirit. And then teach us how to walk by the Spirit. Lord, I say it and, and I can't, God, can't convey it beyond that. I don't know what to say to your people, God. But you have to teach us what it is to daily walk by the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. Conduct yourselves in the Spirit under His control. Teach us how to do that daily, Lord. There's no simple manual how to do that. But if we listen to you, you'll help us. So thank you for all the people listening to me today. Give us the best Spirit-led, Spirit-filled day that we've ever had in our lives. Starting with me, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, and thank you for tuning into this service. I pray it's a blessing. Remember, go to the website should we be able to help you in any other way. Have a great day. God bless you.